Hello, everyone, and welcome to another recorded lecture for genetics. Um, today, we'll be discussing chapter 21, which is population genetics. So population genetics studies the transmission of genetic variation in populations. And this whole class, we've spoken a lot about Mendel's laws and Mendel's principles, which tell us how genetic variation takes place. But what population genetics is going to talk about is how do these different genetic variants get transmitted in populations? Or how do these different alleles um, from crossing over get transmitted in an actual gene pool? So population genetics is a tool we can use to learn about biological functions, um, evolutionary mechanisms, and also about human history. So this map tells us a little bit about human history. This um, cave painting up here came from central sub-Saharan Africa um, almost 5,000 years ago. And this depicts um, farmers with cattle. And we know that most humans, like our primate uh, cousins, do not have the ability to digest lactose, milk sugar, after um, development. So we're only allowed to break down lactose as newborn babies when we need to nurse. And we lose our lactase enzyme, right? That breaks down the sugar lactose. Um, so the lactase enzyme expression stops after a certain point in development. However, there are certain populations over here. These are circles around the central sub-Saharan Africa region and also in Europe. There were two chance mutations that allowed the lactase expression to be on for life. So these two chance mutations allowed individuals in these regions to metabolize milk and be lactose tolerant, right, for their entire life. And these were two separate mutations, one in Africa, one in Europe, that gives rise to lactose tolerance. And otherwise, um, like you can see populations in Asia, um, like China specifically, is largely lactose intolerant. And interestingly, within the United States, most uh, Americans are lactose tolerant, right? Most Americans can consume dairy. However, within the American population, um, I believe, I think it's up to 90% of African Americans are still lactose intolerant to some extent. And American Indians, are still, uh, I believe, over 80% lactose intolerant. And that explains because they came from different uh, populations, right? So again, you come with the alleles, their chance mutations that occurred in just this region of Africa and just this region in Europe that allowed um, those humans to metabolize milk even after um, they were nursing. And of course, if they were around cattle, if they had access to cows and milk, this provided a huge advantage, right? So anybody who had that mutation that turned on lactase for life had a reproductive and survival advantage that they can use the cows around them for nutrition, right? Compared to everyone else, they couldn't have milk and cheese products because they would get sick. So if anybody had this mutation for lactose tolerance, it would be favorable and it would be passed on to the next generation. And that's that's why we see um, this map, right? It tells us a little bit about human history. We know that cattle was domesticated 5,000 years ago, and that provided a selective advantage of lactose tolerance. So let's start talking about populations in depth. This is section one of chapter 21. And let's just define what a population is. A population is a group of interbreeding individuals of the same species living in the same time and place. So we can have a population of humans in Boston, Massachusetts, right? A population of Homo sapiens, right? Would mean that all those Homo, homo sapiens are the same species. They can interbreed and they're living in the same time and place. You can't say we have a population of humans from 1800 to 1850, uh, right? Because you can't 
just you have to talk about a specific time and place. You can't just say like, oh, a 50 year range 200 years ago. And the gene pool is the total of all of the alleles carried in all members of a population. So within this group of interbreeding individuals of the same species, if you were to look at all of their alleles together, that's called the gene pool, right? The pool of genes. And oftentimes we can't look at the entire population. We have to use a sample. So a sample is a number of individuals that represent the entire population. So we can use a sample, right? In order to make inferences about the population as a whole. And it's important that we do samples uh, randomly, right? To get a random sample is important if we wanna make inferences about the entire population as a whole. <clears throat> so now we have to define two types of uh, frequencies. A phenotype frequency is simply the proportion of individuals in a population that have a certain phenotype. The genotype frequency is a proportion of individuals in a population that carry a particular genotype. Okay, so this is pretty simple. And uh, just to explain it in words, to figure out the genotype frequency, you simply count the number of individuals of each genotype and divide that by the total number of individuals in the population. All right, it's the genotype frequency. Um, if you want to look at the phenotype frequency, again, you just look at all the individuals in a population that have a certain phenotype and you divide it by the total number of individuals. So let's see how well we understand this so far. Gene A has two alleles, big A and little a. In a population of 20 individuals, the genotypes are as follows. So you have 12 big A, big A, four heterozygotes, and four homozygous recessive. What is the genotypic frequency of big A, big A? So the genotype frequency is saying how many individuals in 20 out of 20 have big A, big A? So pause the video now. And we would know that it should be 12 out of 20 have big A, big A. So it should be D, 0.6 is the genotype frequency for big A, big A. Right, so it's pretty simple. And the genotype frequencies should always add up to one. So we're assuming these are um, a monomorphic allele, or it's, it's uh, assuming, sorry, it's a dimorphic allele. You have only two types. Um, in polymorphic alleles, meaning if you have like three or more, that gets a little more complicated. But now we're going to assume there are two alleles. There's big A and little a and three different genotypes, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. So these should add up to one. And the allele frequency is the proportion of gene copies in a population that are of a specific allele type. So in 20 people, how many alleles will there be total? And there'll be 40. So if I wanted to look at the 12 big A, big A individuals, how many big A alleles will they have? So they're gonna have 24 total. And those four heterozygotes, how many big A alleles will they have? And how many little a alleles will they have in total? So they'll have four big A and four little a. And those four little a, little a individuals will have how many little a alleles? Right, it should be eight. So if you want to figure out the allele frequencies, you have to just add up the total number. I'll go back for one second. You add up the total number of alleles and you'll be able to figure out the allele frequency. So what is the frequency of A, of big A? So you can pause now. And you might have to use a calculator for this, which is totally fine. And you'll be allowed to use a calculator on the exam. 
and you can pause now. And the answer is D, 0.7. You should have gotten 28 big A. So from here, you have 24, plus here you have four, so that's 28 big A's out of 40 alleles total. So 28 divided by 40 is 0.7. And of course, the frequency of little a allele would be eight from the homozygous recessive, and then four for the heterozygotes divided by 40 gives you 0.3. So this is how you figure out allele frequencies. And for two alleles, they should always add up to one. There's another way to calculate allele frequencies from a genotype frequency. And I'll give you the hint is that you're gonna use this formula um, for the textbook problems. This is presented on the top of page 716 as well. To figure out the allele frequency of big A, what you can do is you look at the number of homozygous dominant individuals and you add that plus half of the heterozygotes. And again, frequency of little a is the frequency of homozygous recessive, little a, little a, plus half of the heterozygotes. So if you want to understand this a little more, it's the same way of saying to figure out the frequency of big A, each person who has a big A, big A, right? You're going to multiply two times that because each of these people has two copies of big A. Plus, you're going to add one times the number of however many heterozygotes there are. For each heterozygote there is, they have one big A. So this is going to give you the number of big A's, but then you have to realize that each person has two alleles for A. So you have to divide all of this by two to figure out the frequency of just big A. So that's the same thing, right? If you're dividing this by two and this by two, it's the same thing as saying that it's frequency of big A plus half of the frequency of big A little a. So I'd like for you to understand this, but you must memorize it at the very least. And don't go further until you understand this. So read it in the book. You should have read the book already. I like this table because it combines all the information we had so far. So for three genotypes, we said 12 had this genotype, four had this, and four had this. Of a total of 20 individuals, right? 12 out of 20 were big A, big A for a genotype frequency of 0.6. Four out of 20 were big A, little a which is 0.2. And again, four out of 20 were little a, little a, which is 0.2. These all add up to one. That's genotype frequencies. And then we can use these values of genotype frequencies to figure out the allele frequency. So to figure out the frequency of big A, we take 0.6 plus half of the heterozygotes, right, which is 0.7. For little a, we take 0.2 plus half of the heterozygotes, which is 0.3. Another way to think about that is that if you had um, 12 individuals with big A, big A, and four individuals with big A, little a, you would have a total of 28 big A chromosomes, right? 24 from here plus four from here is 28. And 28 since, oh, sorry. So since there are 20 individuals, we have 40 chromosomes total. So 28 divided by 40 would give us the allele frequency of 0.7 as well. Same idea. We have from 40 total chromosomes. For little a, we have 8 that come from here, 2 times this. That's 8 plus these 4, which gives us 12. And 12 divided by 40 is 0.3. So I'm tr I hope this is not too confusing. It's hard to see whether you get this or not because I can't see you. Um, and I hope this is kind of making sense. If not, pause here and make sure you can read it in the book and understand it uh, before you move forward. So see if you can answer this question now. So to figure this out, you would take 50 divided by 200, right? There are 50 little B alleles, but there are 200 alleles total. So the answer is B, 
0.25. So now see if you could answer this one. So pause here. So for this, you're asked to figure out the big B allele. You're given that there are 120 little b alleles. And since there are 100 diploid individuals, that means there's a total of 200 alleles in the gene pool. So if 120 are little b, that means the other 80 must be big B. So the allelic frequency for big B is 80 divided by 200 or 0.4 C. So I'm going to skip this for now, and I'm going to come, come back to it. <clears throat> um, actually, I'm going to change this question to make it a little easier, um, and I'll show it to you on the next slide. So if the genotype frequency of big B, big B is 0.46, big B, little b is 0.5, and little b, little b is 0.04, what is the frequency of big B? And you could do this on a calculator. The easiest way to do it is to take 0.46 and add half of 0.5. So that should give you 0.71. D is the answer. So now we could use these terms and apply them. So the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, abbreviated HWE, correlates allele and genotype frequencies. And these were two separate scientists, Hardy and Weinberg, that developed these principles separately. Uh, so in 1908, there was a British mathematician, Hardy, um, and he worked, he looked at allele frequencies and genotype frequencies, and he saw that they would remain constant over time and between generations. And a German physician, Weinberg, reached the same conclusion in the same exact year. So there were five simplifying assumptions um, that allowed Hardy and Weinberg to formulate this principle. These are essential to understand for this chapter. So it's really hard to understand, uh, to study population genetics uh, because populations are so different. So they needed to formulate this principle uh, they formulate this principle based on five assumptions, and their principle does not apply unless these five assumptions are met. Number one is that the population is very large. There's an infinite number of individuals. No population is infinite, right? So these are all ideals. And let me make that clear. All these five assumptions are idealistic. No actual population is a perfect fit to the assumptions. Right? All populations are finite. Individuals mate at random is another assumption. That never happens, right? Hopefully, people don't just walk up and mate randomly, right? We talk to people first, or we choose them based on physical traits, right? There's not just random mating. That never happens. But again, in order to use these idealistic um, equations and the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have to pretend, we have to assume individuals mate at random. We have to also assume that there's no new mutations that appear from generation to generation. Things just stay the same, that allele frequencies are always the same. Again, that's not true because we know that mutations occur constantly. Um, there's also an assumption that there's no migration into or out of the population. And you know, that's very um, hard to achieve because we have trains, planes, and automobiles that take us everywhere and in and out of populations at all times. And finally, it says that genotypes have no effect on the ability to survive and transmit alleles to the next generation. What that means is that there's no impact on fitness. So there's no one genotype that allows an individual to be more fit than another. This again, we know is not true. We know that certain genotypes are favorable in different environments. So none of these assumptions are really ever gonna be found. Um, but if a population is a reasonably close fit to the assumptions, then the allele frequencies will not change over time. And only the genotype frequencies may change briefly to reach proportions predicted by the frequencies of the alleles that make up each genotype.
So if these five conditions are met, we can say they're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Right, so again, equilibrium means the allele and genotype frequencies for one gene locus will not change unless one of these assumptions is violated. So how can we predict genotype frequencies in the next generation? So let's assume that diploid organisms mate randomly. The allele frequencies should be the same in the adults as in the gametes. Right, so think about it. if an entire population meets randomly, right, we would imagine, right, law of segregation, we would say that the allele frequencies should be the same in adults as in the gametes. So we could use the allele frequencies in gametes to calculate the expected genotype frequencies in the zygotes of the next generation. So this might sound a little confusing, but if random mating occurs in populations, we can look at allele frequencies and figure out what the probability will be of each genotype frequency. This is best expressed as using a Punnett square. And this is where um, it gets a little tricky. So put your thinking caps on. The Hardy-Weinberg proportion is mathematical and it's very logical. So you have two choices. You can either just memorize it, which I don't recommend, or you can put a little more time and try to really grasp it and understand it, and it will be a lot easier in the long run. I think it's one of those things where lazy people work twice as hard. Like I, I'll admit, when I first learned about this, I kind of just memorized equations and didn't really grasp the concepts, and I found it a lot more difficult just to know where to apply an equation. And once I took the time to really understand it in depth, it was so much easier because I could just use my brain a little bit and think about which equation to use and why it would make sense. So let's get started. Allele frequencies can be represented as P and Q. The dominant allele frequency, so for big A and little a, the frequency of big A is known as little p. And in our previous example, we said that P was 0.7. The recessive allele is denoted as little q, and in the example, it was 0.3. And we know that allele frequencies should always add up to 1, right? So p plus q is equal to 1. If there's two alleles, p plus q must always equal 1. So I want you to look at this Punnett square, because it's possible to calculate genotype frequencies using P and Q. So in a large population of randomly breeding individuals with no new mutations, no migration, and no difference in fitness, so there's a Hardy-Weinberg um, assumption, we can say that P squared plus 2P squared plus Q squared equals 1. P squared represents the frequency of big A, big A individuals. So it's the percentage of individuals that are homozygous dominant, right? So P squared is the genotype frequency of big A, big A. 2P squared is the genotype frequency of big A, little a. And Q squared is the genotype frequency of the homozygous recessive individuals. And let's see how this makes sense. In a Punnett square, we always write, we write big A, little a, big A, little a. And that would assume that there is an equal proportion of big A and little a, and the eggs and the sperm. But let's say in a population, the allele frequency of big A is actually 0.7, and the allele frequency of little a is actually 0.3. That means that if random mating occurs and there's um, random segregation of the alleles. In all of the eggs of a female, 0.7, of those eggs would have a copy of big A and 30% of those eggs would have a copy of little a. Same thing would apply in the sperm, right? 70% of all the sperm would have a big A, right? That's 0.7. And 30% of all the sperm would have a little a. So let's think about it. What is the chance 
of a egg with big A coming along with a sperm with a big A? Well, you just have to multiply. 0.7 times 0.7, right? If 70% of the eggs have big A, 70% of the sperm have big A, the chance of an egg and a sperm giving a big A is 0.7 times 0.7 or 49%. This is different than what a normal Punnett square would have predicted, right? A normal Punnett square would have predicted 25%, 25, 25, 25. Again, applying this to, let's say the egg had a little a and the sperm had a big A. So you multiply 0 0.7 times 0.3 or 21%. What if the egg gave a big A and the sperm gave a little a? So again, that would be 0.7 times 0.3 or 21%. Finally, if an egg gave a little a and the sperm gave a little a that would represent a nine percent chance so let's see how this relates to the equation if you take p squared p times p right p times p represents the genotype frequency of big a big a right so p squared represents the frequency of big a big a because p squared is equal to 0.7 times 0.7 that represents the genotype frequency of big A, big A. Similarly, to figure out the genotype frequency of little a, little a, it would be Q squared or 0.3 times 0.3. So in this case, it would be 0.09 or 9% would be little a, little a. And finally, for the heterozygotes, we have to do two times P and Q. And the reason for that is we can get a little a from mom and a big A from dad, or we can get a big A from mom and a little a from dad. So for each of these possibilities, which is 21%, we have to multiply that by two, because it could happen in either of two ways. So that's why we do two times P and Q. That represents the yellow heterozygotes. So two PQ in this case would be 0.42%. And all these genotype frequencies must add up to one. So make sure this makes sense um, before moving forward. Oops, sorry. So this graph shows that for any set of allele frequencies, there is only one set of genotype frequencies that would result in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So this is figure 21.4 in the book. And it says over here, we can look at any value of P from zero to one, and any value of Q from one to zero. So let's just take, let's look at the example over here. If P equals 0.5 and Q equals 0.5, that means, and then over here, the colors are the different um, genotypes. I should say that first. The red line represents the homozygous recessive, heterozygotes in green, homozygous dominant in blue. So when P and Q are both 0.5, that means that Q squared and P squared right, are both 0.25. And the heterozygotes are 0.5. And that should all add up to one, right? So 0.25 plus 5 plus 0.25 does equal one. And now let's take a different example. Suppose that P equals 0.8 and Q equals 0.2, right? 0.8 and 0.2. In this case, the most frequent genotype would be big A, big A, right? The homozygous dominant would be the most frequent genotype. Um, it would be about 0.64, it looks like. It's hard to, yeah. 0.64 um, would be P squared. Um, and the frequency of heterozygotes, right again, right about here, would be, looks like about 0.3. So it'd be 0.32. Whereas at such a low Q, it would be about 0.04 would be Q squared. Um, also note that when Q gets very small, right, there's very few homozygous recessive individuals. Most of the people that have, or most of the Qs in the population are being carried by heterozygotes. 
as Q gets very small, right? Look how this drops down dr dramatically in the Q squared. Um, and finally, look at the, um, so you get the most heterozygotes when there's an equal proportion of P's and Q's. So that should also make sense. So with that in mind, for which value of P would there be the most heterozygotes in a population? So the answer is C, 0.5. So to review, these are the calculations for allele and genotype frequencies. Let's see if we can figure out a population, uh, another population question. If the, uh, okay, so let's say there's big D encodes for dark fur and little d encodes for light fur and ferret. If the allele frequency of big D is 0.6, how many ferrets in a population of 100 should have a heterozygous genotype. So pause here and see if you can figure this out. So if we know that D is 0.6, we know that that's what P is. P equals 0.6. Q is equal to 0.4 then because we have to always have P plus Q equals one. And the question is asking for a genotype frequency or a number of people with a genotype. So therefore we have to use these genotype frequency equations. All right, notice that P plus Q equals one talks about allele frequencies, where P squared plus two P squared plus Q squared equals one talks about genotype frequencies. That's a very, very important distinction. So we know that two PQ represents the frequency of heterozygotes. So if my P is 0.6 and my Q is 0.4, that means that 2PQ should be equal to 2 times 0.6 times 0.4 or 0.48. So in a population of 100, you would expect 48 of those to be heterozygous of genotype. And you can see a Punnett square done here where you put 0.6 and 0.4 for the frequencies of big D and little d. And you can see that Big D, little d can happen on either of these two boxes. 0.24 plus 0.24 equals 0.48. So random mating shapes genotype frequencies. So in a population that's not at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, one generation of totally random mating can reshuffle all of the alleles into equilibrium. So this is an important concept. The allele frequency in a population remains constant if there's no mutations or migrations. So even after one generation of random mating, if the allele frequency remains constant, they will shuffle into the genotype frequency equilibrium. So allele frequencies remain constant. The genotype frequencies can reshuffle into equilibrium. Right, and of course that's permitting, there's a large population, no effect on fitness, blah, blah, blah. So for example, let's look at eye color where big B encodes for brown eyes and that's dominant to little b, which encodes for blue eyes. In the first generation, Q is equal to 0.5. So in the first, in the first generation, Q is equal to 0.5 for blue eyes. So that means that P is equal to 0.5 as well. However, let's say in this population, everyone is a heterozygote with brown eyes, right? That can be. If random mating occurs in the second generation, Q will still be 0.5 because there's no migration, no mutation. You still have the same Q. But what would happen then if all these brown-eyed heterozygotes start mating randomly? That's what you should be thinking about. So it's possible if you have a population, the first gen you still have P equals 0.5 and Q equals 0.5, but everyone's a heterozygote by chance. Everyone has big B, little b. So everyone has brown eyes. So this is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But if that population randomly mates, in the second generation, Q will still be 0.5 and P will still be 0.5. So the genotype frequencies will reach equilibrium if there's random mating. And that would give us 
25% big B, big B, or P squared, right, 0 0.25, 2PQ for big B, little b, or 0 0.5, and Q squared for little b, little b. So after one generation of random mating, the alleles will be reshuffled into equilibrium if random mating occurs. So talking about sex-linked genes, it's a little trickier. So sex-linked genes require several generations to reach Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So you need more than a couple of um, random matings to reach Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So take a second to look at this graph. This graph shows how Hardy-Weinberg Hardy equilibrium is reestablished in a population that starts with all big A, big A females, where A is on the X chromosome, and little a, y males. So all recessive males and all homozygous dominant females. So let's look a little closely um, at this graph. On this axis, you're looking at the P value. And over here, you're looking at the Q value. So if P equals point, oh, sorry, P equals zero for males, let's look at males first in blue. And we're looking at the female in pink. So when P equals zero for males, and let's say P would be one for females, right? In this population where you have only big A, big A females and little a, big Y males, right? That means that P would be zero for males. They have no big A. And P is one for females. They only have big A. And in one generation, right? So this is generation zero. After one generation, we see something interesting happen. We see that the females, or sorry, the males become 1.0 all the way up here. And the females become 0.5. And this is interesting. So this is explained by the fact that males only have one X and they get all of their X's from their mom only. So since all the females had a P of one, they only had big A's to give. In the next generation, all of the males will only have a big A. Right, so it's like the, whenever the mothers were in one generation, the sons are in the next generation. And with the females, the females went from one to 0.5. And that's because females get an X from the male and an X from the females. So it's an average of both of the P values from the previous generation. So to figure out in every generation, the difference when you're talking about a sex linked gene, in males, there's always gonna be the genotype frequency of the females before. I'm gonna show you this um, on the next slide as well. And the frequency will continue to oscillate up and down but it will go closer to the average by generation six. So it takes about six generations for it to average out the, for the sex linked, for the P's and, Q, P's and Q's to be averaged out amongst males and females for a sex linked gene. All right, and again, this is explained because newborn males have the same allele frequencies as their mothers in the previous generation because males only get their X from their mom. So whatever the moms have in one generation, the males will have in the next. So if the moms have 0.5 in this generation, the males will have 0.5 in the next. If the females have 0.7 in one generation, the males will have 0.7 in the next. When females have 0.69, then males will have that in the next. So they keep on, and then the females keep on doing an average of the two generations. So over here, the female is 0.5 because that's an average of zero and 0.1. Here, the female is an average of 0.7 or 0.75 specifically because it's an average of 0.5 and 1. 1 1.5 divided by 2 is 0.75. So let's use an example. If the allele for X-linked recessive baldness, Q equals 0.2 for the mothers, right? Meaning that of all of the um, X chromosomes in females, 
20% of those have Q, meaning the, the recessive allele for baldness, then 20% of the sons will be bald. Newborn females have an allele frequency that's equal to the average of male and female allele frequencies in the current generation. And that's what we just saw over here. So this is a summary slide. The frequency of big A, Y, and little a, Y males are simply the values of P and Q. Because again, males only have one X. It could either be P or Q. If it's dominant, it's the P. If it's recessive, it's the Q. So a big A, so the genotype of big A, Y males is the same as the allele frequency for P. Right, so again, the genotype frequency for big A, Y is the same as the genotype of the allele frequency for big A. The genotype frequency for little a, y is the same as the allele frequency for little a, which is q. And the frequency of big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a females, meaning x, x being dominant, heterozygous x, or little x, little x females are the same as autosomal. So we can use the same p squared, 2pq, and q squared to figure out sex-linked um, genotype frequencies in females. So this slide is a summary. In males and females, if you have an autosomal gene with two alleles, we always know big A, big A is P squared, big A, little a, 2P squared, little a, little a is Q squared. For an X-linked gene, in females, it's the same because you can have either two Xs, heterozygous, or two little Xs. But in males, you only have one X. So the genotype frequency of dominant males, big A, Y is just equal to the alveol frequency for P because they only get one P, right? Or they only get, in this case, one Q. So random mating may seem unrealistic in human populations, but for a lot of genes, humans rarely select mates based on a specific genotype. So it's very rare that you see humans um, picking somebody for a specific genotype. Um, so a lot of these loci that don't affect phenotype can be used to solve crimes or identify human remains. So I wanna talk about um, some forensic analysis. So the FBI uses 13 different specific loci um, where they want to look at forensic analysis. So it's called CODIS, the Combined DNA Indexing System. So CODIS is again used um, for forensic purposes to try to identify individuals. So criminal investigators need to look at 13 different loci of a suspect and see if all of those match with the crime scene. So this is shown over here. So over here, you see that there are 13 different loci among all these chromosomes throughout the human genome. And we have to make sure that the 13 locus genotype matches um, the suspect with the crime scene. All of these are SSRs meaning they're simple sequence repeats. So if you remember, an SSR is one to 10 base pairs long and they repeat a number of times. So each of these loci, so TPOX on chromosome two, everyone has a different number of TPOX repeats over and over and over again. So these are all SSRs and they're unlinked. They're very variable between two individuals. So we're looking at a very small uh, likelihood of having two people randomly match since you're looking at 13 different highly variable unlinked loci. So we can use the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium to calculate the likelihood of getting a match between a suspect and the crime scene. So this is how you calculate match probability. So suppose we're looking at one locus and the frequency of one allele is 0.5, sorry, 0.05, and the frequency of a different allele is 0.03. We could say that the genotype 
frequency of the heterozygotes is equal to 2pq, which would be 0 0.003. Let's say for a second locus, you're a homozygote, and you know that the frequency of allele 1 is 0 0.04. You can look this up in a table. Therefore, the homozygous genotype frequency will be Q square, uh, P squared, or 0 0.04 squared, which is equal to 0 0.0016. So now, what is the likelihood of somebody getting a heterozygous locus 1 and a homozygous locus 2? We could use the product rule to calculate the probability of a match at more than one locus. So the probability of a match at this locus and a match at this locus would be 0 0.003 times 0 0.0016, which is 4.8 times 10 to the negative 6. Very, very low number, right? Five millionths of a chance of getting that. So you're really not going to have a very large probability of, uh, of people getting these two matches. So it's only, if you did the frequency, it's about 0 0.0000048. So it's about one in every 208,000 individuals will have just these two loci matching. Now imagine if you apply that with 13 different loci. Right, so the frequency of getting 13 different matches is so low. So suppose that you get a, um, a DNA sample under the fingerprint of a victim, and you get that the probability of a match is 7.7 .7 times 10 to the negative 15. So therefore it is one times three times 10 to the 14th times more likely that the DNA is from the suspect than from a random person. Another way to think about it is if you have a match with all 13 um, loci, only one in 130 trillion people would have the same set of alleles. Uh, since the population is only about 7.5 billion individuals, this is very compelling evidence, right? that it's one in 130 trillion you can be convinced of with DNA matches using the CODIS system. So here, what, I sh what I'm showing you is a gel with an amplified TPOX allele of four DNA suspects. And you're also looking at the DNA from the crime scene. Which of these suspects cannot be excluded? So you can see that B has the same number of TPOX repeats as the crime scene. So the crime scene DNA, again, we have two different chromosomes for each individual. So one chromosome had nine repeats of TPOX. The other chromosome had six repeats of TPOX. That represents a heterozygote. The only other individual with the same number of TPOX repeats is individual B. A cannot be the murderer, C cannot be, and D cannot be. B possibly can. How many TPOX repeats does suspect B have? Right, we say C, nine and six repeats. Below is a table from the STR base, which is a database frequency of all the SSRs we have for the allele frequencies of these four different um, STRs. Using the results from the gel, determine the probability match for the crime scene DNA of repeats nine and six. So how would you figure this out? For TPOX nine and six, and these are the frequencies of each allele. So you can pause here. So to solve this problem, you look at the uh, frequency for six repeats of TPOX is 0 0.002. Um, and then you look at for nine repeats 0 0.119. And what you're being asked for is a heterozygote, which is equal to 2PQ.
So you would take 0 0.002 times 0 0.119 times 2. And that would give you the percentage of individuals that have heterozygous um, 9 and 6 repeats for TPOX. The answer is A, 3.0476%. Again, very, very small population, a small probability of getting those two repeats. What is the likelihood of a homozygous individual having two alleles of TH01 with 10 repeats each? So you can pause um, this now. So the answer is you would have to look at TH01 with um, 10 repeats is 0.008 and you would square that. So it would be 0.0064% B. So that is the end of section 21.1. So that's a good stopping point to make sure you understand um, how to figure out genotype frequencies and allele frequencies. Um, also understand what Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium means and how the allele frequencies and genotype frequencies remain constant from one generation to the next. Um, understand also how to determine the match probability of a DNA profile using the Hardy-Weinberg equations. So today, or now, we'll talk about what causes allele frequencies to change in real populations, right? What do we know in reality um, if we can't always have the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So let's take the example of blue eyes in individuals of Europe. So blue eye color varies greatly in different human populations. And we see an abundance of blue eyed individuals in Northern European countries. So about 80% of individuals around Scandinavia have um, blue eyes. Um, other regions in Europe have anywhere from 20 to 79% of blue eyed individuals. But in Northern Africa and Eastern Europe, fewer than 20% of people have blue eyes. So when you look at uh, Northern Africa or Eastern Europe, you see very few uh, blue-eyed individuals and a lot more brown-eyed individuals. And this all corresponds to OCA2 allele frequencies. So there is a gene called OCA2, and there is a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism, and the enhancer upstream of this gene um, that determines whether you have blue eyes or brown eyes. And if you have an A SNP in the allele, that's brown eyes. That's the normal. But if you have a, mutate, a mutation and your A gets um, changed into a G, right, like a single nucleotide polymorphism, that encodes for blue eyes. So you can see around Europe and um, Scandinavia, here all along Europe, you see a lot of blue-eyed alleles with the G. But elsewhere, you see a hu I mean, huge predominance of the A allele. So this SNP chart, right? And again, these are little pie charts that represent the proportion of the A to G SNP. This corresponds with the geographic um, distribution of blue-eyed individuals. So the Hardy-Weinberg um, equilibrium provides a starting point that we can model populations about. So natural populations rarely meet the five assumptions that Hardy-Weinberg tell us because new mutations are going to always arise um, by occasion. That's, that's the nature of DNA polymerase and the mute, mute to genes around us, um, we know that no population is infinitely large, right? There is a finite number of matings. Uh, we know that there are migrations of small groups and individuals in and out of populations. And mating is not random. There is what's called sexual selection, um, which can be up for debate, but for the most part, um, we humans do select partners based on characteristics that are not random. And there are specific phenotype um, differences in fitness. So I should say genotype specific differences in fitness. So depending on your genotype, you are or are not more likely to survive and reproduce. So there are these 
five realities that kind of um, contradict what Hardy Weinberg equilibrium you know demands. So the Hardy Weinberg equation is useful to estimate population changes through a few generations, right? So it has a lot of limitations. It's not a useful equation to predict long-term change, but it's a good starting point to model population deviations. So another type of simulation could be used to model long-term changes in allele frequencies. And these are called Monte Carlo simulations. So it's a computer program that models possible outcomes of randomly chosen matings over a number of generations. So this models the effect of sampling errors, as we'll soon see. So the Monte Carlo program has a starting population with a number of individuals that are homozygous and a number of individuals that are heterozygous. So you can type this in to the program. You start off with a population of how many heterozygotes and how many homozygotes of a certain trait. And the computer uses a random number generator to choose an outcome for each mating pair event. So they're saying, okay, what if this big A little A individual mates with this big A big A? What is the chance that the heterozygote will give the little A, right? And then multiply that by the probability of big A big A giving a big A, which is going to be one. So they figure out the genotypes of the offspring at each generation based on these probabilities. So this, again, will model the effect of sampling error because it's all random. It's picking, it's all probabilities. So you can do, I'm so sorry, you would have to do multiple Monte Carlo simulations um, to see all the possibilities and all the deviations that could come out of the different probabilities. So again, this is a way to model all the different um, possibilities. So sampling error results if you don't take a representative sample, right? You make an error. You take a, you take a group of people that don't truly represent the bigger whole. So this is called genetic drift. Genetic drift is caused by random sampling error. So genetic drift is a term Right, that again just means that the sample does not represent the larger group. Right, so that's what genetic drift is. So allele frequencies can shift dramatically and sometimes be eliminated when only a part of a population can survive to reproduce. So this is an example um, that's best illustrated with a simulation. So again, what I'm trying to illustrate here is how random sampling error right, just by randomly picking something wrong, that's called genetic drift. And it's not what you'd expect, right? When you take a sample um, that is representative, if you take a good sample that's large enough, right, you can model that out and see uh, how different genotypes in a larger population would deviate. But oftentimes you can have genetic drift if you don't take a good enough sample. So let's say we have a jar with two colored marbles. We have 50 blue marbles and 50 yellow marbles in this jar. So here's my jar, 50 yellow marbles and 50 blue marbles. And I'm going to take 10 jar, uh, 10 marbles at random from the first jar. If I got a good sample, right, a representative sample, I would expect five yellow and five blue. But this is random sampling error. I picked just randomly 10 marbles and seven happened to be yellow and three happened to be blue. So suppose those that represents my allele frequency, so to speak. So if I restocked the jar for the next generation, I would have 70 yellow marbles and 30 blue marbles now. Like that sampling error that does not represent the larger whole. So now, if I keep on picking 10 marbles from here, I would get, let's say, nine gold or nine red, um, sorry, I can't speak, nine yellow marbles and one blue marble. And then if I were to restock that again for another generation, right, that would be 90 yellow to 10 blue marbles. And then if once again, I were to do, take 
another 10, chances are I would get only 10 yellow marbles. And if I were to restock my next generation, the allele frequency totally changed from 50-50 to 100 to 0. So this represents genetic drift. You randomly selected a sample that did not represent the larger group. And allele frequencies can shift dramatically, right? They went from 50, 50 to 100 to 0 when only part of a population survives to reproduce. So this means, and for some reason, the blue allele, again, let's take it out of the jar example. In reality, maybe the blue allele was harmful. So after every generation, the blue allele was less likely to be present in the gene pool. So over time, the allele frequency completely shifted when only part of the population survives to reproduce. So the Monte Carlo simulations model long-term changes in allele frequencies because each time a simulation is performed, it represents a possible pathway of genetic drift. So the change in allele frequencies, right, again, genetic drift is a change in allele frequencies that's a consequence of just the random sampling error from one generation to the next. So just to see, these are what Monte Carlo simulations look like. Um, so six different Monte Carlo simulations were done um, with two initial populations of heterozygous individuals. So you start off with a frequency of big A of 0.5 here. And this initial population has 10 individuals over here. And you can see, and the computer will pick what is the chances of each big A, little A individual mating with the other. So each color on the graph represents a different run of the simulation. And in a small population of only 10 individuals, you can see how various, how many possibilities you can have. Um, and you can get a situation where you get only one big A or no big A's or anything in the middle. So having a very small population is not necessarily um, very predictive. If you have a large population, suppose you have 500 individuals in the simulation, you'll see that each individual, mod, um, each individual simulation model is kind of around the mean, right? So if you have a large population, you're gonna have less genetic drift, less sampling error. And again, this can be illustrated if you had a lot more, if you picked out 100 marbles instead of 10, right? And you had a lot more marbles in the jar. Let's say you had 1,000 marbles in the jar and you picked out 100 every time. It would be less likely that you're going to completely eliminate one allele that way. So the population size does make a difference. So in larger populations, over 30 generations, the allele frequencies would be stable. So there's a term called fixation. So fixation is when only one allele in the population survives and all individuals are homozygous for that allele. So you can see that um, this green run of the simulation had fixated already at about like 14 generations. The one in yellow fixated even before that. And once you get that, there could be no further changes because you're not getting any mutations and you're not getting any migration. So once you fixate on one allele, there's no more changes in that population. And that could be not that great if there's a change in the environment, right? There's no um, variation to select from. So at each generation, the changes in allele frequencies are relatively small. But over many generations, there could be a large change in allele frequency. So now let's talk about types of genetic drift. So the founder effect is one type of genetic drift. And the founder effect occurs when a few individuals separate from a larger population and then establish a new population. So that's again, because of sampling error. So let's say over here in this example, um, 
we have some individuals with two alleles each. And over here, it looks like the yellow alleles uh, for whatever is, is originally found in this population. But for whatever reason, just a group, a small group of these individuals colonized a different island. And nobody with the yellow alleles were in that sample that went to the different island. Once this island is repopulated over many generations, you're going to have a lot of red and blue alleles, but no yellow. So this does not represent the larger group. This is genetic drift. And this is called a founder effect when a small group of individuals leaves and repopulates um, in a way that does not represent the population they left from. A good example of this is the Pennsylvania Amish um, have a very high incidence of genetic diseases compared to German Amish. So a small group of German um, Protestant individuals left for America and established a small colony in Pennsylvania, Amish country, so to speak. And they intermixed a lot. They interbred with each other. And that explains why they have a high incidence of genetic diseases because they spread a lot of recessive um, alleles. And also they don't represent the larger Amish um, uh, population in Germany because it was a small group that left, right? They don't necessarily represent the larger whole. So again, this is an example of, let's say of all these colors in the initial population in Germany, but only a few Amish individuals uh, cross the Atlantic and establish a population in Pennsylvania. So these have different colors now than the original population. And again, there's a high population of individuals with genetic diseases. Um, polydactyly is, is one, having an extra finger. Another type of genetic drift is a population bottleneck. And this is when a large proportion of one type of individuals die. And this is usually due to the environment. And this is unfortunately the case in cheetahs, which were once very, very common. And now there are only two populations. There's one in South Africa and one in East Africa. Um, the Ice Age was one major bottleneck. Um, so the cheetahs could not live in Ice Age climates. And also human hunting was a huge bottleneck. So if you started off with all these different, let's say within a cheetah population, there were 25 different alleles for a particular gene. So for one gene, there's 25 different alleles in cheetahs. But unfortunately, most of the cheetah population was reduced. So most of that variation was gone. Only very few individuals were left. Very few cheetahs were left. So those few cheetahs were able to breed and then make a new population of cheetahs. But now you have only three alleles out of the 25 in the population. So now these individuals are nearly identical, nearly genetically identical to each other within each population because of the bottlenecks. So to illustrate natural selection, we can look at pocket mice um, in the New Mexico desert. So mice in regions with light colored soil have light colored fur, whereas mice in regions with black volcanic rock have dark colored fur. And this is so they could escape uh, predators. So if you look at a black mouse in this light colored rock, it can easily stand out. Therefore, any dark colored mouse in a light environment would have been selected against, right? It would have been eaten and would not have survived long enough to reproduce and pass on its black gene colors. However, this mouse with light fur, right, can live in this environment. So these mice would be able to survive long enough to reproduce and pass on their genes. So over time, you would expect the lighter regions of the New Mexico desert to have more lighter colored mice and the darker parts of the desert to have darker colored mice. So that's how natural selection acts through environmental conditions, right? The nature is selecting which organisms can survive and reproduce. So now we're going to talk about how selection alters the expected allele and genotype frequencies predicted by Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. 
And I just want to talk about fitness for um, a second. So natural selection acts on differences in fitness to alter allele frequencies. And fitness is an individual's relative ability to survive and transmit its genes to the next generation. Right, so this is a statistical measurement. It cannot be measured in individuals within a population. So the fitness is a, of a, is a relative statistical measurement of the ability to survive and transmit the genes to the next generation. So it cannot be measured in individuals in a population, but it could be measured in all individuals of the same genotype within a population. So you could attribute fitness to a genotype within a certain population. Um, there are two basic components to fitness. There is viability, right? How long can you survive and reproductive success? Can you pass on this gene? So in the mouse example, the fitness of light colored fur in the dark volcanic soil is really low, right? If you have light colored fur in the dark environment, you do not have a high relative ability to survive and transmit the genes to the next generation. So very low chance of viability of reproductive success, right? So we know that the process that progressively eliminates groups of individuals is called natural selection. So that should be clear um, that the individuals whose fitness is higher become parents of the next generation. And this occurs in all natural populations. So now I want to talk about how selection. So um, we're going to talk about how in populations that undergo selection, each genotype has a relative fitness. So again, we can't attribute um, a fitness to an individual. We can only say that a genotype within a population has a relative fitness. The relative fitness can be anywhere from zero to one. Um, if it has an equal possibility, if it's just as fit as everything else, we'll say that the maximum fitness is 1.0. Whereas if the genotype makes you die and has no fitness at all, that would be a, a fitness of zero. So the largest number it can be is 1.0. If the relative fitness um, is less than one, that means it's a less fit genotype. So for example, in a population with two alleles, you have big A and little a, we have three possible genotypes, big A, big A, big A, little a, and little a, little a. And the uh, capital letter W is what represents relative fitness. So the relative fitness of each genotype can be summarized or denoted as big W with subscript little a, little a, the fitness of the homozygote, the fitness of the heterozygote, and the fitness of the homozygote recessive. Right, so it's a value between zero and one. Um, so the relative frequencies of each genotype at adulthood could be calculated by taking P squared, which is really the proportion of zygotes that have P from a sperm and P from an egg, multiplied by the relative fitness of having a big A, big A genotype. So again, if you predict it, if you have a certain value for P squared and there is no deficiency in having that genotype, you'll have a fitness of 1.0. So the relative frequency will be the same as P squared. Same idea, if you want to figure out the heterozygote relative frequency, you would multiply whatever you get from 2PQ times whatever the relative fitness value is for the heterozygote. And then of course, the same idea would be Q squared. So suppose that having a little a little a genotype is really bad, right? It reduces your chance of, of survival by 50%. So we can say that the relative fitness for little a, little a is like 0.5. So whatever you think you get in your population in Q squared, it's not really the case. Because if you have a Q squared, if you're born Q squared, you're not going to even make it to the next, uh, you're not going to make it long enough to be able to survive and pass on your genes. 
So if you have Q squared, you only have a 50% chance at surviving. So the relative frequency of that genotype at adulthood would really be Q squared times the relative fitness of the little a, little a genotype. So I hope that's kind of clear. Um, so another example, right? We said that in cystic fibrosis, being homozygous recessive is lethal before the reproductive age, but being a carrier is not harmful at all. So if you were to assign relative fitness values, you would say that having um, little a, little a is a zero fitness. You have no chance of survival. Whereas being a homozygote dominant or a heterozygote carrier gives you the same likelihood of reproducing. So that would be a fitness value of one. So now we have to get into a little bit of math. Um, this does get a little complicated. The book goes into more detail, breaking down and deriving all of the equations. So that can be helpful as a starting point. Um, and you can always rewatch this as many times as you want. So we have to come up with a value for the average fitness of the offspring population. So after reproduction, of, of one generation, what is the average fitness? We would have to take P squared and 2PQ and Q squared and multiply them by each of their relative fitness values. So this average, this is called the normalized, um, this is the normalized mean fitness, the average fitness, this is W with a line over it. Anything with a line over it is the average of. So the mean fitness, is the p squared genotype frequency times the relative fitness of the homozygote dominant, the heterozygote genotype frequency times the relative fitness of the big A little a, and then of course the genotype frequency of q squared times the relative fitness of the homozygote recessive. When the genotype fitnesses are different, if you have a different phenotype difference, the average fitness will be less than one. These will not be add up to one if one of these phenotypes, I'm sorry, if one of these fitness values is lower, right? The only way to get a fitness value of one is if all the fitness genotype, uh, all the fitness values are the same. If this is the same as this and this, if you have a value of zero, for example, for the fitness value of little a, little a, you're going to get a average fitness that's less than one because this value will be zero. So, right, not all gametes from the initial population can contribute to the next generation if the fitness value is less than one. And as selection continues, the mean fitness will get closer to one. So as you eliminate all of these harmful alleles, you're going to end up getting a mean fitness closer to one. So if you want to modify the Hardy-Weinberg equation to take into account um, the fitness values, this is the equation we can use. And this looks a little complicated, but this is normalized. This is a normalized version of the fitness modified Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So, this is another way to look at it. The book, um, I like this, the way that the book um, portrays this, it starts by saying that we have two alleles. We have big A or little a. And we know that the sperm or egg can either have big A or a little a. We say the frequency in the parental gametes of big A would be P, little a will be represented as Q. Great. So for the offspring, what are the chances of a little p sperm and a little p egg coming together, right? That's represented as p squared, right? A big a little a, right? What are the chances of a big p or sorry, a big a sperm coming with a little a egg or vice versa? It's 2pq. And then we know that little a little a is the chances of a q, like a little a sperm and a little a egg coming together. That's q squared. The relative fitness we know is represented by big W. So the relative frequency after selection, meaning 
how many of these people, of these babies that are born, actually grow up to survive, right? You have to take this value of the zygote frequency and multiply it by the value of the fitness, the relative fitness. So if it's one, this will stay the same. This value will be the same as this value. But if it's harmful or if it's less fit to be, let's say, homozygous recessive, then this value will be lower than this value. And you want to normalize the adult frequency, right? You want to put it in an actual term, an actual value. So you would divide each of these relative frequencies by the mean fitness of the offspring, by the average of the, all the offspring. So you're normalizing it. So you have an actual value and not just a relative value. And we'll go through examples. So this is a little confusing. I will give you um, a cheat sheet before the quiz or the exam rather. I'll give you some equations that like on a list. I'm not going to tell you which equations to use when though, but I will give you a list that you can use on the exam. Um, but again, you have to know when to use which equation. So again, the book is going to be very helpful um, in understanding this as well. So after selection, we would have to expect a change in allele frequencies, right? So we could represent the new allele frequencies after one generation of selection as little, as little p prime and little q prime. So what you would have to figure out is what is the new value of Q after one generation of selection? So you would have to think about the change in Q, right? This is the, the new frequency is going to be lower if the fitness was less than one. So this takes into account your initial population with the relative fitness of little a, little a times the genotype frequency plus half of all of the heterozygotes times their relative fitness. So again, you're thinking about what is the new amount of little a's in my next generation. So however many heterozygotes, I'm um, sorry, however many homozygote recessive individuals you have, you multiply that by the fitness of little a, little a, and then you take half of all the carriers times the relative fitness of the carrier. And that gives you the new allele frequency when you divide it by the mean uh, fitness. So another way, and I could give you this equation, if you reword this, or if you re-express this differently, it's um, a little easier to plug it in like this. And you would be given values for the original Q and fitness values for little a, little a, and big A, little a. And you should be able to figure out what the new allele frequency is after one generation of selection. So delta Q represents the change in the recessive allele after one generation. So how much, right, how much did the uh, frequency of the recessive allele change after one generation of natural selection? That's what delta Q is uh, saying. So delta Q is equal to Q prime. This is a way to represent Q prime minus Q. So this is a way to represent the change in Q due to selection. The change in Q is equal to Q prime minus Q. And you could figure this out um, again using values that you would plug into the equation. Right, so you do not need to memorize these equations, but be able to use them. So this, sorry. So here we can look at the final box, right? So this is um, the summary of what we just showed. The new P value after selection, right? You would have to take into consideration the fitness of P squared, the fitness of the heterozygotes, and then divide that by the mean fitness, 
right? Same thing. The new queue after one generation of selection will change by this um, expression. And the normalization factor, you would have to add up um, the genotype frequencies times each of their relative, uh, relative fitness values. So this chart shows how the lethal recessive allele frequency um, decreases over time. So if you have a cystic fibrosis allele, over time it will decrease after many generations. So you would predict that it kind of decreases stably. And in fact, that's what's observed. If you start with a Q value of 0.5 and your fitness value is zero, over time, you're going to drastically decrease the level of people who have that allele. And the ones who have the allele will only be found in carriers because if you're homozygous recessive, uh, you won't be born. Right? And the rate of decrease depends on the initial allele frequencies, right? How much of the Q is initially present in that population. And as Q approaches zero, the rate of decrease gets slower and slower because you have more heterozygotes. So it's hard to get rid of it. When you get rid of all the homozygous recessives, that's like a huge decrease in Q. But then you have a lot of carriers and carriers still pass on that Q value. So I want to start with a problem to actually put this into practice. So take a second to read this. So it says in Europe, the frequency of the CF allele causing the recessive autosomal disease cystic fibrosis is about 0.04. Cystic fibrosis causes death before reproduction in virtually all cases. Determine the values of relative fitness for the unaffected carrier and affected genotypes. Assume no selective advantage is associated with heterozygosity for the diseased allele. So to do this part, let's do this problem first and try to figure it out first. So pause here um, and see if you can answer it yourself. So a good relative fitness value, right, for being big A, big A, or big A, little A should be one, because whether you're healthy or a carrier doesn't make a difference. However, if you are little A, little A, or you're a homozygous recessive mutant for cystic fibrosis, you die, so you have a relative fitness value of zero. So now you're asked to determine the mean fitness of the offspring population with the respect to the cystic fibrosis trait. So what is the average W after one generation of selection? So basically what we're saying is in a population where there is some prevalence of the, of the cystic fibrosis allele, after everyone mates for one generation, what is the next generation gonna look like? taking in consider into consideration that having cystic fibrosis will kill you, right? What does the next generation look like? So we have to use our um, equation that says, so this is the solution to the first part, the average fitness at birth of the population with respect to cystic fibrosis is equal to P squared times WAA times two P squared times the fitness value of the carrier plus it's Q squared times the fitness value of the homozygote recessive. So that would be, again, you would have to take into account the values that you were given. You were said that the allele causing cystic fibrosis is about 0 0.04. That's your Q value. Q equals 0 0.04, which means that P, right? must be 0.96 because P plus Q always equals one. So to figure this out, we would say P squared, which is 0.96 squared times the fitness value of being healthy, which is one plus two P squared, which is two times 0.96 times 0.04 times the fitness value of being a carrier, which is one plus Q squared, which is 0.04 squared. But since this is a fitness value of zero, this whole value is zero. So the average fitness is gonna be just equal to these two surviving genotypes, which will give us an average fitness of 0.9984.
So again, since one of these fitness values was different, we're going to get a fitness, an average fitness that's less than one. So let's do the second part. Um, determine the expected change in the CF allele frequency over one generation when measured at the birth of the next generation. So this is asking what is the change? What is the delta Q? What is the change in CF allele frequency after one generation of selection? So after one generation of all the homozygote recessive CF people dying, what is going to be the new Q? So to use to do this, we have to use the equation of delta Q equals Q prime minus Q. So we know what our Q is already. We have to figure out what our Q prime is. But the new Q is after selection. So we have our Q squared value, which is 0.04 squared. We know that's zero. So this becomes nothing. So what we're doing is we're taking half of 2PQ times the fitness. This is a mistake in the... Um, Ugh, why did it do that? So I'm going to, this is a typo in the image because this should be big A, little a, and I'll make sure that you have the right equation um, in the book. Let me just check. Actually, does the book have the same mistake? It does. So in, in the book, um, it has a similar mistake as well. Um, but we could still, 21.5 has it correctly. So this equation is, uh, is correct. So with P equals 0.96 and Q equals 0.04, and we know that the relative fitness values are one, one, and zero, we can plug in the values into here. So it'd be 0.96 times 0.04. And then all of this will be multiplied right in here. So you start off with WAA minus, um, so it's zero minus one. So that's a negative one times Q. And then from that, you subtract P times the fitness value. This is going to be zero. So you're not really subtracting anything. And you divide that over your mean fitness, which you figured out was 0.9984. So when you substitute these values, you get a delta Q of minus 0.154 times 10 to the negative three. So it's a very small value. So you're gonna have a very, uh, there is selection against Q, but it's a very slight um, selection. You still have some Q, um, some cystic fibrosis carriers in the population. So right, so just to, Reiterate, they're going to take that. Um, I'm going to fix that later. So make sure um, you can plug in the values um, into the equation and get this number. And again, it looks very complicated, but you'll see a lot of times these amount to zero. So you could just ignore a large part of it. Um, but keep in mind that this is a typo um, that should be big A little a, the fitness value of big A little a. So we'll now go to the last section of this chapter, um, which talks about how the fitness of different genotypes varies based on your environment. So Homo sapiens migrated out of Africa um, about 70,000 years ago, and exposure to UV from the sun decreases as you go from the equator. So the farther you are from the equator, the less exposure to UV light you have. And UV light affects vitamin D3 production as well as skin cancer incidence. So the more UV uh, exposure you have, the more the likelihood you have skin, you could get skin cancer by damaging your DNA. And individuals who live close to the equator have darker skin which normally protects against skin cancer. So melanin, right, is a pigment that can shield DNA from UV light. 
so it could shield the DNA from being damaged and preventing against skin cancer. Um, farther from the equator, lighter skin allows for more UV light to penetrate through to make more vitamin D. So there's a trade-off here. So skin pigmentation is a complex quantitative trait, which is determined by multiple alleles at different genes. It's not just one gene gives you one kind of skin color. It's actually a multiple of different genes that work together uh, to produce skin pigmentation. And there are different um, alleles of different genes that show strong associations with different populations around the world. So you can look at um, the geographical distribution of allele frequencies at two different skin pigmentation loci. So you can look at um, Africans who have, um, in this SNP, there's this one pigmentation gene called KIT-LG that encodes for um, reduced pigmentation. So if you have an A that encodes for reduced pigmentation, if you have a G that is increased pigmentation. So you can see there is always a small minority um, even in African populations that have reduced pigmentation, but based on a founder effect, based on how humans migrated, and also based on selection, based on UV exposure, you see that this A SNP is a lot more prevalent um, in Europe and Asia. So Europeans and Asians share a common SNP in this KIT-LG gene responsible for reduced pigmentation. However, Europeans and Asians independently accumulated different mutations in another gene that reduced pigmentation even further. So there's another gene called SLC24A5, which is, um, again, if you have a G, that's another mutation that has, um, sorry, if you have an A, that's another mutation that reduces pigmentation. So Europeans acquired a different mutation um, with an A, a little a, that will reduce pigmentation even further. So two separate mutations occurred at different points in human history to reduce pigmentation in regions of low sunlight. So again, this is like an accumulation. Um, and this tells us a lot about human history as well. So we could take another example, um, such as sickle cell anemia. And Sickle cell anemia is a recessive trait that's caused by mutations in the beta globin locus. So sickle cell anemia, we know, um, is a result of a single amino acid change from glutamic acid to valine um, at the sixth position of the beta globin protein. And it's an interesting case because it actually pays to be a carrier of sickle cell in certain parts of the world. This is called the heterozygous advantage. So individuals that are carriers of sickle cell are resistant to malaria. So it turns out that having partial sickle cell shaped blood cells reduces the ability for the mosquito to pass on the bacteria that causes um, malaria. So this actually is good and bad because it keeps the recessive allele in the population, right? Because you have heterozygotes that survive malaria, they have an advantage. So you're gonna have more heterozygotes around, but that actually keeps the recessive allele in the population, which will still give you some people with sickle cell anemia. So we can say that the relative fitness, depending on where you are, can, it's, it's different. So in regions where there is malaria, right? Where there, in regions that there is malaria, it pays to be a carrier of the sickle cell allele. And that's what explains why the, the distribution of the sickle cell allele corresponds almost precisely with the distribution of malaria. It's actually, you have higher fitness 1.0 is your relative fitness to be a carrier compared to only 0.8 to be have both copies of beta globin healthy because these individuals might get malaria and die, right? These individuals with sickle cell have no chance of survival. So the relative fitness can change based on the time and place. 
So balancing selection is what is called um, when it maintains the deleterious allele in the population. So the beta A is the normal, beta S is the recessive disease allele, and since the heterozygotes have a heterozygote advantage that makes them less susceptible to malaria, um, there's this balancing selection that keeps that bad allele in the population. So it actively maintains uh, genetic polymorphisms, mainly due to the heterozygote advantage. So I'm just going to skip this. And uh, now is a good time to pause before we go through um, a couple more examples. So I'm going to give an example that illustrates uh, the dependence of fitness of individual genotypes on the environment. So fitness really depends on the environment and the environment influences fitness. So we could talk about uh, the evolution of pesticide resistance. So there's an insecticide called DDT um, that began uh, being used in the 40s. And this would supposedly be able to kill a lot of the mosquitoes that were transmitting yellow fever or malaria. Um, and it would be able to reduce uh, crop destruction by agricultural pests. So it's a really widespread insecticide. Um, it works as a nerve toxin in insects. However, shortly after its introduction, there were dominant mutations found that allowed these insects to detoxify DDT and survive. So the resistance uh, was because of a single gain of function mutation that overexpresses an enzyme that can break down DDT. So any of these mutants can be sprayed with DDT and still survive because they can just break it down. So with insecticide application, we see that there's a strong selection for heterozygotes. There's an ulcer, there's a heterozygote advantage in here as well. It's better to only have one gain of function mutation than to have two gain of function mutations. And regardless of the type of insecticide, resistance has evolved within 10 years of its commercial introduction. So within 10 years of DDT, insects started becoming resistant. Then the new one came out, then they became resistant. We see this um, the same uh, in bacteria with antibiotics. Right? Within a few years of making a new antibiotic, bacteria ac uh, acquire resistance, that antibiotic. So there's a specific example with DDT in mosquitoes in Bangkok. So the use of DDT in Bangkok began in 1964. And in 1964, at first, right, most of these um, were susceptible, little r, little r, as the susceptibility to DDT. So mostly everyone was at first little r, little r in 1964. But then there was this mutation from little r to big r, which is that enzyme that can break down DDT. So after um, a few years, after just two years of use, you start seeing a drastic increase of big R, big R individuals that are resistant. And as these individuals, they saw that almost 100% of all the mosquitoes were 100% RR, R, big R, big R. So that was really um, interesting. Um, by, it was by mid-1967, the resistant big R, big R homozygotes were nearly 100%. So at this point, they're all resistant to DDT and there's no point in using it anymore. So the DDT applications were stopped and the response of the mosquito population was very interesting. So if they stopped in 1967 and look what happens one year later, all the RRs start to drop and you see an increase in carriers and the susceptible mosquitoes again. This means that big R, big R genotype conferred a fitness cost. In the absence of DDT, it was actually harmful to have a big R, big R genotype. So the environment changed and that changed which, which genotype was most fit. Right before it was best to be, um, to not be little R, little R. 
right? So it's actually an example of the heterozygote advantage once again. It's best to have one copy of the mutant and one copy of the wild type allele, right? In the absence of the insecticide, resistance is subject to negative selection. So this is a review of all of the different ways we can have um, evolution, which is just the alteration of allele frequencies. So you can review this um, on your own. I like this as a, it's a good graphical depiction. So just for example, under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, you say if you start off with a certain allele frequencies of different colors, if there's no migration, there's random mating, no mutation, no uh, natural selection, then over time, a later population will still have the same allele frequencies. The allele frequencies do not change. With natural selection, certain individuals might have lower reproductive success. So over time, a later population would have a genotype with the lower reproductive success becoming less common. Right? Mutation, you can get do alleles pop popping up. And genetic drift, like in our cheetah example, if a chance event eliminates some alleles from the old population, the new population will form with a different subset of genotypes that does not represent the initial, right? That's genetic drift, the sampling error. So the last section talks about ancestry and the evolution of modern humans. So there's two kinds of ancestry. There's biological ancestry and genetic ancestry. So biological ancestry is who gave birth to who, right? So whose parents uh, belong to you, right? Who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? Who are your great-grandparents? That's biological ancestry. And each person alive today has two to the K power of biological ancestors K generations ago. So for example, one generation ago, you have two ancestors, you have your parents. Two generations ago, right, two to the second, you have four grandparents. Three generations ago, right, you have two to the three or eight grandparents. Great grandparents, sorry. So if you have how many great grandparents, great great grandparents, right, you can figure this out um, just by using this two to the K equation. And this is assuming that the ancestors were not related because then there would be some redundancy. And this is a nice way to look at two individuals that are biological, um, brother, they're biological siblings. So Dion and Anna, they're siblings and they each have different combinations of DNA. So you can look at these are the great grandparents and of course, the mother gives mitochondrial DNA as well, shown by MT. And the father gives the Y chromosome as well. So you can see from each individual mating, right from the great grandparents. So here's, these represent the grandparents. And this generation, right, contributed 50% and 50% to their mother. And these grandparents contributed 50% and 50% to the father. And then of course, 50% of these genes and 50% of these genes then went to each of them. So it's 25% of each of the grandparents, plus the Y chromosome from as way back as can go to the great grandparents and the mitochondrial DNA from mom. Both sexes have mitochondrial DNA from mom. Only the males have the Y uh, chromosome from the paternal lineage. So that's biological ancestry. Genetic ancestry is which DNA segments did you get from your biological ancestors? So genetic ancestry is what's determined by a lot of these kits. And genetic ancestry, again, for Dion and Anna, they both have chromosomes 1 through 22 and the mitochondrial genome, um, but only Dion has the Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome is what traces the paternal lineage and maternal DNA traces the maternal lineage. Mitochondrial DNA traces the maternal lineage. The autosomal DNA, chromosomes one through 22 undergo recombination. 
So the ancestry of individual segments must be traced separately. All right, it's not there are individual segments um, that get mixed and matched through crossing over random recombination. Um, so they're not going to have the same alleles necessarily unless they're identical twins. So a fun thing to do would be to think about your parents and grandparents and figure out um, what your ancestry is. So I want to discuss the uh, most recent common ancestor. So the most recent common ancestor is a useful term to describe genetic ancestry. It is the specific genomic region. So the most recent common ancestor is not a person. It's a region. It's a gene region that has been passed down unchanged to two or more current individuals. So the most recent common ancestor is a specific genomic region that's shared by two or more people, right? And that was passed down um, generation to generation. So this woman over here carried uh, the most recent common ancestor for one gene region that was passed on from generation to generation the same exact sequence has been passed down. And today, five individuals still have that same exact sequence, um, that same um, MRCA, that same most recent common ancestor sequence that was carried by this uh, female. All right, so all five people alive today still share that allele. And this was passed down generation along the unbroken line, right? Meaning. A it was passed down from generation to generation. So you can use sequencing technology to figure out, right? This is how a lot of the G DNA tests work. You can figure out um, where your ancestry traces back to by seeing where um, your most recent common ancestor um, alleles were. So we could look at mutations, right? To figure out at which point there was deviations. Um, so you can look at shared mutations of individuals um, to trace back your lineage to the most recent common ancestor. So suppose at first um, this most recent common ancestor was A, 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 A. That was the original sequence. Um, then you can say that there must have been a mutation at this point over here. Um, because everyone coming from this point has a mutation. And there must have been a separate mutation along this way because everyone has a single point over here, this A got switched to a T and these individuals. But at every other point, there was still A, 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 A. So you know that this didn't mutate here. It only mutated at this point because this person has the A, A, T, A, A. Right, this person has the AATAA. There must have been a different mutation here to give you this AAAGA. Oops, sorry. Right, because if this person had it, AAAGA, and these two people had it, right, but this person did not have it, that must be that there must have been a mutation at this point. Right, same idea. There could have been multiple mutations occurring at each point. So you can trace um, these mutations to track the genetic ancestry to, your, uh, to the most recent common ancestor allele. So now that we have access to a lot of DNA sequencing technology that's relatively inexpensive, we could learn a lot about human origins and um, the early human migrations out of Africa. <clears throat> so about 200,000 years ago, um, anatomically modern Homo sapiens arose. So humans that looked like me and you um, were in Africa about 200,000 years ago. But it took um, a while. It took about until 60,000 years ago, 60 to 70,000 years ago for the cognitive revolution to occur in which humans can cooperate flexibly and in large numbers and were able to migrate outside of Africa, within Africa and outside of Africa. Um, so they moved to Europe, um, into Asia, and also to Oceania. Uh, most recently, there were migrations uh, right to North America, the Americas. 
And we now know that African uh, Africa is where Homo sapiens evolved because of the DNA sequence diversity. So African populations have more DNA sequence diversity than any other population. So that suggests that there was enough time, right? 150,000 years ago, there were all these varieties, right, of, of Homo sapiens. Um, only subsets of humans later emigrated to other parts of Earth, right? And also the mitochondrial and Y chromosome DNA is um, most diverse in Africa. So humans were here the longest. They had the most time to get accumulate mutations and um, accumulate diversity. Only subsets of humans then migrated out that represented only a fraction of this diversity. So the migrations of humans across planet Earth is like a series of founder effects in a way. Um, we have a term to describe um, the most recent common ancestral mitochondrial DNA from a female. So mitochondrial Eve is the term of a female who lived about 200,000 years ago, who gave her mitochondrial DNA to all of the populations um, of Asia, Europe, um, Australia, and uh, New Guinea. So this is called mitochondrial Eve um, that originated in Africa. Um, and we can figure out the rate of mutation. We can figure out, we can look over time and we can figure out how long it took for a certain group of people to migrate by looking at the rate of mutation of mitochondrial DNA. So we know that mitochondrial DNA mutates at a given rate. So you could compare two DNA samples from thousands of years apart, or you don't know that yet, but you can look at the mitochondrial DNA sequences and knowing how frequently they mutate, you can figure out how far apart those two DNA samples were from. So we know that mitochondrial Eve lived in Africa, um, and that was kind of the branch point from which all other um, humans evolved from. Similarly, the Y chromosome led to a um, chromosome, Y chromosome Adam, who lived about 200 to 300,000 years ago. And African populations, again, display a lot more diversity in Y chromosome sequences than anywhere else in the world. So that also indicates that Y chromosome Adam is also African. Um, so it's very interesting. And then again, you can use this information to help trace human migration. So about 60,000 years ago, again, 70,000 years ago, we said a small founder population that contained only a fraction of the diversity uh, repopulated the rest of the uh, world. So about 10,000 years ago, right, again, you see a very um, great reduction in diversity outside of Africa. We now know that we had some uh, relatives around. So we had other um, members of our genus Homo. So we would consider these humans as well. Neanderthals and Denisovans are also human. And uh, we know that from our DNA sample, uh, from their genomic DNA samples. So we have bones, we can sequence them, and we share a lot of commonalities with Neanderthals. And in fact, all of us have Neanderthal DNA inside of our genome, which is evidence that humans, human uh, Homo sapiens were able to mate with Homo neanderthalensis because we all have some part Neanderthal DNA in us. So Neanderthals lived in Europe from about 500,000 years ago, so before us, to around 30,000 years ago. So Neanderthals, Evolved. So this is the earliest Homo species in Africa was uh, Homo ergaster. Um, and again, this shows different migration patterns outside of Africa. I like this because it shows you the time period and the location. So this shows how Homo erectus uh, kind of went this way. And then how Homo sapiens came out in Africa about 70,000 I'm uh, sorry, about 200,000 years ago anatomically, but they started migrating about 70,000 years ago at about this point. They started migrating to Europe 
And at this point, there were also Neanderthals in Europe. So from about 500,000 years ago to 30,000 years ago, there were Neanderthals in Europe. Denisovans were um, in Europe and Asia, mostly in Asia, from about 600,000 years ago to again around 30,000 years ago. So these are offshoots. We have relatives, we have our very close cousins. And Homo sapiens interbred with Neanderthals in Europe. That's this mating over here and over here, right? They coexisted at these times. And also the Denisovans in Asia. So if you're if you're of Asian descent, you have some Denisovan DNA. If you're of European descent, you have some Neanderthal DNA and and some mixing and matching of the two. So this is a stopping point. Um, we will do problem solving in the next part. So take, a t uh, take the time to do the whiteboard problems and all of the problems that I'm going to show you here. So do all these problems um, before starting part two of chapter 21.